Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm back on the die filer this week, and I'm going to build the drive mechanism, all of the machinery inside the die filer that drives the file up and down off of the motor. And that's going to include building a pulley for driving it off the motor, which should be pretty cool. All right, let's go. The drive mechanism in this machine is a scotch yoke. There's an animation of it here if you've never seen one of these. It's a very space efficient way to convert rotary motion into linear motion. The other key advantage it has for this machine is that it's very tolerant of misalignment between the two axes. So the axis of the crankshaft there can be quite offset from the axis of the linear motion and this mechanism will still work. That's important because as you may have noticed when I machined the base casting, I made no particular effort to get those axes well aligned. The build notes are clear that you don't have to do this because of the scotch yoke drive mechanism, so just getting the two axes well aligned on their respective casting bosses was enough. The first part I'm going to make here for the drive mechanism is the slide block. Now the drawing specifies tool steel for this, or carbon steel, but the kit came with this bar stock, which I'm no metallologist, but I don't think that's tool steel. You can't necessarily tell alloys by looking at them though, but eh, certain steels have a look to them and this doesn't look right. There's only one way to be sure though, and that's to see if it will harden. This is the PTC Instruments hardness tester. It works by using a calibrated center punch, which you then view through a microscope that has markings inside it that tell you how hard the steel is based on the size of the punch mark. It's obviously soft right now, about 20 Rockwell C. So now I'll take it to the torch and I'll heat it up to a glowing cherry red and quench it. And if this is tool steel, then it will get very hard after doing that. If this is mild steel, then this will have no effect at all, except making my shop smell like french fries. This punch mark calibration thing requires a clean flat surface, so I gotta sand the crud off there from the quenching first. Then I can use the center punch once again and inspect that mark. And survey says nothing happened, so that is definitely mild steel. That's fine, I'll put that in the mild steel bin and I'm going to go grab some tool steel. I don't have any flat bar of tool steel, but I do have the offcuts from the crankshaft material. And actually, if I take some measurements here, I think I can squeeze the slide block out of this round bar. This is actually going to be a convenient setup. I can just put the stock in a collet chuck here and I can mill the entire part in one setup here. So I'll start by milling this down to the rectangle that we need. I'll touch off with the milling cutter and then mill down to the difference between the thickness of the slide block and the diameter of this material. The cool thing about doing this in a collet block setup is that now after that first pass, I can take the block out flip it 180 degrees, and just mill the other side down the same amount that we just did. That will automatically give us the part that we need in the center of the round bar on this dimension. No math or anything required. Just make sure to align the collet block the same way each time on X, just using the edge of the vice jaw there is an easy way to do that. And away we go for the other cut. With that dimension established, once again, coolness of the collet block, I can rotate it 90 degrees and do the same thing for the other dimension of the part. This works great, you just gotta be very sure that before you start doing this that there's enough cross-sectional area in the middle of your round bar to get the square piece out of it. But when you can, this really works great and it's very efficient. I'll do some deburring here and final inspection to make sure my dimensions are okay. And that is looking good. So now I can square up the end. We have not established the length of the part yet. That's still a rough bandsaw cut on the end there from the round bar. So I clean that up with a little bit of side milling and that will be all we need to do for now. Now the cool thing about this setup is that we actually have one more feature we can do. We can do the hole through the center of it. So I'm using the edge finder to find the center line on Y and the end on X. That allows me to locate the hole here through the center of this little block. I'm drilling out to the pre-drill size for the reamer. This needs to be a really close tolerance fit on the crank pin. So to that end, I'm going to do some checking here. I want to know exactly how big this crank pin is. This crank pin was made with drill rod, which was then hardened. 
so it might be a little bit off dimensionally from what I expect. That is 6 tenths oversize. That's good information to have. So I'm going to start by reaming this to the nominal dimension of that drill rod, just in case the reamer cuts a teeny bit oversize, then we won't end up too big. That does occasionally happen with reamers, not often if your setup is good. After that, a quick test fit with the crank pin here. Let's see how we did. And that is very close. Like it feels like it wants to go in there, but it's not going to slip in there. So that's probably the six tenths right there. And that's good, so we're not oversized. The next step then is to go to my oversized reamer in this dimension. I keep over under reamer pairs for all the common sizes that I use. And the oversized reamer is going to open that hole up just a little bit. Oversized reamers are generally half a thou or one thou over the nominal dimension. This is a one thou oversized reamer, and I run that through, and honestly, it'll feel like nothing happens because the cut is so light that you can't even feel it. But trust me, something did happen there. Second test fit here, and just like magic now, that crank pin is a perfect, perfect fit in there. It slides down in there, it spins freely, and there's no play in that at all. So over under reamers are a really great tool for getting perfect fits on pins like this. If your pin is a little bit undersized, start with the undersized reamer, then work your way up to the nominal size reamer and then the oversized reamer until the fit is perfect. That's all we can do in that setup. So I'm going to take it out now and I'm going to chop it off of the stock that we're holding there on the bandsaw. I put the little clamp on there when I cut round bar on the bandsaw because bandsaws can grab round things and spin them and catch your fingers. So a little clamp prevents that. Then back into the mill, and I just side mill that guy down to final dimension here. Then on to the sacred ritual of deburring. And let's take it for a spin here on the crankshaft. Now the instructions do say you can harden this block if you want, it's optional. And I thought about it, but I got such a good fit on the pin there that I don't want to harden it and risk changing those dimensions. So I've decided to leave this as annealed tool steel. But hardened tool steel on annealed tool steel is still a good friction pair. Leaving the block unhardened also ensures that the block will become the wear item here, and the block is a lot easier to remake than that crank pin would be. Not that it matters much for the amount of use this machine will see, making it out of Lego would probably be fine. Next up is the yoke, which the kit includes this casting for. It's a really nice looking little casting. Now it's got draft angle on some sides and not on others, so that's going to influence how I decide to fixture this thing. I'm going to clamp it by the sides because those are straight. However, the top and bottom have draft angles, so I need to know how much to remove here to get in the ballpark of the final dimension here that's in the drawings. Most surfaces on this piece are not going to be machined, so I have to factor that into the order of operations here. I'm setting it up in the vise with emery paper, which helps grip the rough cast surfaces and takes up the imperfections in it. And I'm squaring it up using the sides there that don't have draft angle on them. Away we go making chips. Cast iron is really fun to machine. It's so soft and pleasant, and you get great finishes with it with very little effort. It is messy, however, and well, that's just something you learn to live with. With the bottom flat and the overall height of this correct, I need to make a groove down the middle for the slide block. I'm going to center this groove, but the sides of this casting will remain rough casting. So there's no point in getting out the edge finder because edge finding on a rough casting is a bit of a fool's errand anyway. We just need this to be more or less centered. So for that, I'm going to use a quick and dirty method, which is to wiggle the cutter back and forth. I have got my hand on the top of the spindle there until you feel it start to touch the casting surface. Zero the DRO there. Go around to the other side and do the same thing and then use the half function to get zero on the center line of the part. So it's doing the same thing you would do with an edge finder, but with the rough casting surface, there's no point in swapping tools to get the edge finder in there, because the edge finder is not doing that great a job anyway. 
Nothing too tricky here. This is a straightforward operation. I'm starting with an end mill that's a little bit narrower than the final slot so that I can ensure a good surface finish on both sides of the slot. So I rough cut out the center here, doing pretty heavy cuts down the center, and then that will leave me enough material on either side that I can side mill with lighter cuts to ensure a good finish on both sides of the slot. That's fairly important here because, of course, the sides of this slot are bearing surfaces for the slide block that we just made. With that rough cutting operation, I establish the depth of the slot. I'm checking as I go here with the depth micrometer. And I'm also checking in three places along the length just to make sure I'm not getting any taper here along this slot because this is a key part of the mechanism. I want to make sure it's going to run really smoothly. There, of course, shouldn't be any taper here because the slot and that bottom surface were cut in the same setup. But, you know, the part might have moved in the vise or the quill might have shifted or some other unexpected thing. So, always good to check. Once that depth is correct, then I side mill out to final dimension, as I said earlier, making sure not to touch the column or the quill. With the cutter remaining at exactly the same height, you can then widen the slot and the cutter won't mar the finish at the bottom of the slot because the cutter is in exactly the same place that it was when it created that bottom surface. To sneak up on the width of the slot, I'm using gauge pins to monitor my progress here. Just a bunch of trial and error with different size pins until you find the one that just barely slides in there nicely. Once I've got the current size, then I also, again, check it in multiple places just to make sure I'm not getting any taper in the slot here. And then I proceed from here. There's lots of ways to measure the width of a slot. You can use adjustable parallels. You expand a parallel in there and then measure that. You can also use gauge block stacks to measure that width. So whatever is most convenient for the setup. In this case, gauge pins seem the easiest. Okay, we should be there now. Oh, it's really, really close. Like it's so close. I don't want to take another cut because it's going to end up oversized. It's just a couple of tenths due to the microscopic deflection of the cutter when side milling. I think that's all that we're missing there. So rather than take another cut, I'm going to lap the block in. That'll be safer and actually end up with a smoother running mechanism. A little bit of work with some 400 grit emery on the glass plate there. And now that block slides in there perfectly. And oh boy. That moves really, really nicely. Really pleased with that. The nice thing about lapping in the block rather than widening the slot is that you also end up with a really sweet surface finish on there. Because of course, lapping is just manual surface grinding at the end of the day. Here's a random pro tip. Dedicate a chip brush to cast iron. Because what I've learned the hard way is that the brush immediately gets filthy if you use it on cast iron. And then everything else that that brush touches gets filthy. So. Cast iron brush, only used for cast iron. That's all I can get out of this setup now, so I'm going to set it up sideways for the rest of the operations using the slot that we just machined there, the bottom of that, as the reference surface. And then I'll use copper wire on the movable jaw to take up the imperfections and the draft angle of the cast top surface there. So the next thing to do is side mill this down to length. The drawing specifies a final length for this part which is fairly important because otherwise it won't fit through the opening in the end of the casting, as you'll see. But these sides don't have to be square because they're not interacting with any other features. You just have to side mill the part down to length. So I'm not making any effort to make sure those sides are square to anything on the casting here. Next is a cross hole that holds the file rod, and I do want this to be square to the groove there, so for this I'm going to put a parallel in the groove there. Parallel is a little too wide for the slot, so I kind of wedged it at an angle. That's fine, it'll still be running parallel to the slot. And then I can run a dial test indicator on that parallel, and I can get the groove level with the mill here so that the drilling will go square through the part relative to this slot. Now this isn't actually that important because the slide block can rotate inside the yoke here as needed to keep it aligned with the file rod, but eh, doesn't hurt. Then I can edge find on the fixed jaw there and the end of the machined part there to get this cross hole in the correct place. I drilled this through to the nominal size of the drill rod that's going to be running through here. This doesn't have to be a super accurate fit, I don't need to ream it here, a drill is fine. Now the next step is this slot here, which creates the clamping mechanism here for the yoke on the drill rod. 
And for that, I want to double check the fit of this hole here. Now the drill rod almost goes through, but it gets stuck partway through. It's just within the tolerance of the variance of the diameter of the drill rod. So decision time. I could leave it this way and hope that the yoke expands a little bit after cutting that slot. And if it doesn't, then I could ream it after the fact. However, that's risky because while I do have a spiral flute reamer for the nominal size, if I need to use my oversized reamer, the oversized reamer that I have in this dimension is a straight fluted reamer. And if that slot is already cut, I cannot use a straight fluted reamer to open it up a little bit because you can't use a straight fluted reamer in a situation like this where there's a slot cut into the side of the hole because the flutes of the reamer will get caught in that slot. That's one of the reasons that spiral flute reamers are a little more flexible. So because of that, I'm gonna do the reaming first. I started with the nominal size reamer, just in case the drill cut a little bit undersize, which can happen if the grind on the drill isn't quite perfect. So I ran that through there and then tested the drill rod again. Didn't feel like anything happened on that reamer, so probably this is still gonna be undersize, and indeed it is. So then I go through with the oversize reamer. And yes, you can do this while the part is still in the mill, which is honestly better. I just forgot to check this before I took it out. But with a cut so light, you can just run the reamer through there by hand. Just remember to always turn it forward. Don't ever run a reamer backwards, even by hand, because you'll dull the flutes doing that. So with the oversized reamer run through, make sure there's no burrs or chips in there. Another test with the drill rod here, and now that's a perfect sliding fit. Very happy with that. So now I feel good cutting the slot to make this into a clamp. This casting is easy to fixture for this slitting operation. The trick is getting the saw on center line there. To do this, I'm gonna put the drill rod in there, the file rod, and use it as reference. So I bring the saw down to the top of the rod using a feeler gauge so we don't scratch up the rod. I'm feeding with the column there, not the quill. I zero the z-axis, and then I do the same thing coming up from the bottom with the same feeler gauge. And then I use the half function on the z-axis on the DRO, which you can do with the head, but not the quill. That's why I'm using the head for this. Then I feed the head up to zero, and we're on center line for that hole. Very easy. The best advice I ever got for slitting saws was to do the full depth of cut all at once. It's terrifying, and you don't think it's going to work, but it really does. The reason for this is that with a full depth of cut, the saw clears chips properly. When doing light cuts, slitting saws have difficulty keeping the teeth on the saw clear of chips. So a full cut, though, works just fine, even on a small machine like this, once you get over the terror of it. The next step is the clamping bolt. Now, when doing a clamping feature like this, it's always a question of should you do the slot first or the bolt first? Because I did the slot first, the slot is going to want to collapse while doing the bolt features. So I just put the saw blade back in there to hold the gap there while doing all of this drilling. The advantage to doing the slot first is that getting the depth right on the clearance drill in the top half of the slot is really easy because you can feel the drill break into the slot. You don't have to get your depths exactly perfect. Of course, the disadvantage of doing the slot first is, as you see here, you have to support the slot while you do everything else. I've gone both ways on this over the years. These days I lean more towards doing the slot first because it's just lower risk as far as getting the drilling depths perfect. But like any clamping feature, you drill all the way through with the tapping drill, then you drill the top half with the clearance drill, then you tap the bottom half of the hole, and in some cases such as this, you finish by counterboring the top for the head of the bolt. In this case, I'm using a half inch end mill and just plunging down because this happens to be a good fit for the cap screw that's gonna go in here. The other secret to getting clamping features to work correctly is the length of the bolt has to be just right. The clamping has to be done by the shoulder of the bolt and that has to happen before the bottom of the bolt bottoms out in the bottom of the thread. That can be difficult to get just right, so if you tighten it and it isn't clamping, that's probably why. But that's working really, really well. Clamps and unclamps just like it should. So that's it for the yoke feature. We've got enough parts here to do some mock-up, so let's see how things all fit together here. I'm going to get the crankshaft into the main casting there, and then the slide block goes on the crank pin, and then the yoke goes on top of the slide block. And you got to kind of align everything just right so that you can push the whole assembly into the casting there. Now you see why the hole in the back of the casting is so big. I didn't understand that until I went to assemble this the first time. Then the file rod will go down through the middle there and we can clamp it in place. That's moving well. Things are a little bit stiff yet. They need running in and there's no oil in anything, of course. But more importantly, there's a clearance issue at the bottom of the stroke here. The castings are impacting there. 
The easiest fix there was just to file the corner off of that yoke casting there. It was really close. There was just a little bit of something on the inside of that casting that was colliding. And now that goes all the way through its motion. So things are looking up and down and up and down. Well, that's all fine and good, but turning that shaft by hand is frankly worse than filing by hand. So what we really need is some kind of a pulley on here such that we could derive this with the awesome power of electrons. I think I might be onto something here. Let's give that a try. I found this slab of aluminum here that I can make a pulley from. This kit is BYOP, so I'm going to have to make one here. I don't have any in the shop that I could use for this. I'm going to scribe out a rough circle here, a little bit larger than the final pulley, so that I can turn it down to final dimension. And then I'll rough cut this out on the bandsaw. No, sorry, trepanning mafia. I'm not going to be trepanning anything here. This material is not thick enough to hold it in the chuck and trepan out the shape. And I need the full thickness of this material to get the pulley thickness that I need. With that rough cut to shape, now I can hold it in the four jaw chuck, and I'm going to get that center punch mark there aligned with the center line of the lathe, just to make sure that it'll clean up without getting into my saw cut there. An easy way to dial this in is just to put the dead center in the punch mark, and then dial in the dead center. And Bob's your uncle. That punch mark is now on the center point of the lathe. I'm also going to dial in the face here, even though this is going to be machined. Again, I want to remove minimal material here, so that I make sure to keep as much width here on the material as I can. This material is just barely thick enough to get the pulley out of. I start by drilling that out to a pretty decent starting size, big enough to get my little boring bar in there, and then I bore this out to final dimension to make sure we've got a really nice concentric hole here with a good finish inside. And I'll test fit on the crankshaft there to make sure I've got a good sliding fit. And that is very, very close sliding fit, but it is a sliding fit, so I am going to leave it right there. And I'm going to face the front here while I've got it in the setup, and that'll give me a face that's perfectly square to that bore. The variables really came together there on that surface finish. Came out really nice. The true test, of course, is the Swarfy test. If he tries to kill the other duck, then I know it's a really good finish. Swarfy does not play well with others. While I've got it in this setup and everything's nice and square, I might as well put the keyway in it. For that, I'm going to use this tool here, which turns my lathe into a shaper that I can use to cut this keyway in situ. I'm going to skip through this process because I've shown it in detail before. If you want to know all about it, check out my video, Keyways Three Ways, where I explain this process and two other ways to do keyways without a lot of fancy tools in a home hobby machine shop. One more test fit with the crankshaft. Now with the key installed, the Woodruff key that we put in earlier. And that's a really nice fit. Really happy with that. That should be nice and strong there for driving the quarter horsepower that this motor is going to push through this pulley. The rest of the operations are going to be done on a mandrel, and hilariously, I have the perfect mandrel. This is an offcut from the crankshaft with the test cut of the Woodruff key slot that I did to make sure that I could cut a Woodruff key slot on my mill. You may have seen that video. So I can use it now with a threaded hole cut in the end, and using the Woodruff key, to slide the blank on here and finish this operation. Or you could plan ahead better than I did and use the crankshaft for this before you assemble it. Now that bolt in the end is not clamping the piece to the mandrel. It's just keeping the piece from sliding off the end because of course the key is in there and that's doing the driving. And because of that, I can use the back of my collet chuck as the shoulder against which the part is referenced. Normally you can't do that with a mandrel because as you tighten the bolt in the end, you'll pull the stock out of the chuck. But in this case, the bolt doesn't have to be very tight, so I can get away with that. And we get to do some pretty exciting high-speed turning. Because of the large diameter, we can really crank up the speed here, which aluminum loves, so it's breaking chips really nicely, and we're getting great finishes. Normally on aluminum, it's hard to get a small lathe like this running fast enough, because aluminum really loves speed. But once you get it cranked up like this, boy, the insert can do its work, and you get great results. Less so on this facing cut, where I have to take lighter cuts so the chip breaker is not engaged, and the RPM gets too low towards the center, both of which contribute to the spaghetti bird's nest mess that aluminum loves to make on the lathe. Honestly, I most of the time really hate turning aluminum for exactly this reason. It's really hard to avoid the giant bird's nest. And the only one that likes this is Swarfy the Duck again.
onto the vGroove now, which is what makes this into a vGroove pulley. So Machinery's Handbook has all the numbers that you need to get the dimensions right. It's more complicated than you might think. I'm using a size A belt less than five and a half inches in diameter, which means I have a 34 degree angle. And then there's numbers given here for all the other dimensions. You might think that the angle is always the same on all V-belts, but it isn't. The angle actually depends on the size of the pulley and the size of the belt. I'm not sure why, but that's how it is. I'm going to start by cutting the center of the bottom of the V there, the flat section. So I'm going to center up my grooving tool here just by touching off on both sides of the work, zeroing the DRO, and then dividing that by two on the other side to get zero into the center, just like you would with centering something with an edge finder on the mill. And away we go. The DRO is making this cut much easier because I could just touch off on the surface and then using the radius mode on the DRO, measure my depth that way. Otherwise I'd have to be trying to measure the diameter of this, but this slot is so thin right now that it would be difficult to get any kind of measuring tool in there. So I'd have to set up a dial indicator on the tool post or something like that. But the DRO makes this easy peasy, aside from the usual bird's nests. This grooving tool is a little narrower than the final bottom of the V needs to be there, so I then translate left and right a little bit and do an additional cut to the same depth to finish out that groove. Now for the exciting part, the V groove sides. Machinery's handbook tells me the included angle for my situation is 34 degrees, so I'm setting my compound to 17 degrees so I can cut each half of the V groove here. I'm going to do this with the same grooving tool, even though we're feeding it at an angle. This grooving tool is still going to work okay. The groove isn't very wide and I don't have any other tools that would really fit in here. Surface finish will be a bit of a challenge with a grooving tool because the corners on it are very sharp, but I think it'll still be okay. Then from here it's a standard taper turning operation. I'm feeding with the compound, the carriage is locked, and the cross slide is sitting there making googly eyes at me. Remember that my z-axis on my DRO is set at zero in the center of my blank, so to get the width of the groove right that's quite easy. I just pan sideways doing a series of passes feeding with the compound until I get to half of the final width on the DRO that I need, and then do the same the other direction, and I'll end up at the correct final width, or at least I would have. To improve finish, I did a very, very slow feeding pass and a very light cut at the end on each side. A round nose tool would have done a better job here on finish, but again, I didn't have anything small enough to fit in the groove here, so just feeding extremely slowly will still give you a good finish, even with a sharp cornered tool. And then I swung the compound 17 degrees the other way and did the same thing. All that stuff I just said sounded right, didn't it? And well, I think it was, and yet, I blew that dimension on the final width there of that v-groove by quite a bit. I realized what I had done is on my DRO I forgot to compensate for the width of the grooving tool, so my groove is overly wide by that amount. Now with a v-belt, the reason this matters is because the belt now sits too low in the pulley and it's bottoming out in the bottom of the groove, and that's a problem because the belt will slip as you see here. The way v-belts work is the angled sides are what's gripping and doing the driving. The groove has to be deep enough in the pulley that the belt does not bottom out in there or it will slip. As you can see with this larger size belt, which is not bottoming out, now I have tons and tons of grip. I can't make it slip. All of this is exactly why the depth of the V groove is specified as a minimum in the specification. The good news is the fix is pretty easy here. I just need to machine that root of the V a little bit deeper to compensate for the overly wide top of the V. Again, just to make sure that the belt is no longer bottoming out in there. After that, now that belt is nice and tight, no more slippage. Of course, the belt is sitting too deep there, so I could turn down the OD of the pulley a little bit, but I just left it because it'll just help retain the belt a little bit better. I could also use the larger belt, but that's a very heavy belt and way too much for this little machine. Finally, I removed the belt and turned the remaining little bit of detritus there into kind of an extension hub. I originally planned to just face that off, but then I decided actually a little hub here could be helpful to give me some offset from the base casting here, so that's what I did. And then a file to break all the sharp edges everywhere, and this pulley should be pretty much done. One final step here, and that's to put a set screw in there to hold the pulley onto the shaft. For that I'm going to set it up in the mill. I'm going to put this right in the middle of the V groove, and I didn't need to edge find this because thanks to my many years of experience and highly trained eye, I can just eyeball this right in the center there, no problem. 
I drill with the tapping drill size all the way down into the center there, right on top of the key slot. And then to make clearance for the tap wrench, I drill down with a clearance drill most of the way down, leaving enough at the bottom there for threads. And then I can come in with the tap and feed the tap wrench all the way down into the little section at the bottom where the tapping drill size is and cut the threads. Luckily the pulley is not too big and I can do this with a standard tap. For really big pulleys, they make special pulley taps exactly for this job. Note that the set screw goes down on top of the key and not the shaft. That's a great mechanical design trick because it means that the set screw will not mar up the shaft and make the pulley impossible to remove in the future. Okay, pulley done. Let's do some assembling here and see how things are looking. Well, it's not going anywhere. And it seems to spin nicely, so, so far so good. Let's get the belt in here and mock it up with the motor that I hope to use with this die filer. This motor needs a rebuild, but for now it'll be part of the mock-up here. So the idea is they'll sit roughly this far apart, like so. And then I'll bring in the table here, and then the table will sit kind of here-ish once it's all complete. Now that motor might be a little close there. I can get a longer belt if needed. I'd like to keep the whole system as compact as possible so it doesn't take up a huge amount of bench space, but I'm going to start compact here and I'll expand later as needed. Now let's do a rough estimate of how fast this is going to run. Just comparing the inner dimensions of the pulleys there, and I measured the outer dimension with the belt installed as well, which gives me a range, and the ratio there is from 1.5 to 2.5, which gives me an RPM range of 718 to about 1100. The kit recommends about 800 RPM, so we should be pretty good here. That motor doesn't run right now, so I can't show you that, but I can give you a little test run here with a big O-ring and a drill. So there it is. It's die filing, sort of. Now you can hear a bit of a ticking noise there, and what's going on there is the yoke has a bit of rock in it because some of the clearances aren't quite right. None of the bearings are fixed in place yet, and I need to do a little bit of tuning on the dimension of the slide block and some of those other clearances in there to make sure that the yoke is running smoothly on the front face of the crankshaft there. But in general, it's running smoothly and I'm happy with that. So I'll do a little bit more fine tuning on final assembly there and make sure everything is running quietly. But so far so good, I think. The drive mechanism seems to be in good shape and ready for the next step. I hope you enjoyed watching me assemble all these intricate little pieces and seeing a scotch yoke in action. It's a very cool mechanism, as I said at the top. Thank you very much for watching, and thanks especially to my patrons for making all of this content possible. And I will see you next time.